The name of quite a few ancient civilizations is associated with the central city or region of the civilization. Ancient Rome comes from the city of Rome. Ancient Greeks referred to themselves as Hellens, adopting the traditional appellation of the Hellas region. While Egypt is a misreading by the ancient Greek of the name for the early capital of Egypt, Hecapta, which is commonly known today as Memphis. No, 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 not that knockoff version. However, unlike these civilizations, the name China is not associated with any specific city or region. Instead, it derives from the Qin Dynasty, the first imperial dynasty of China, established by the legendary Qin Shi Huang, who unified China and established a centralized imperial system that has endured until today. Despite the vast amount of historical records on Qin Shi Huang, the emperor himself was shrouded in mystery both before and after his reign. Our tale extends beyond just the already mystifying terracotta army, which alone consists of 8,000 lifelike soldiers guarding Qin's tomb. Included in this story are also legends of a bad omen involving the alignment of Mars in the night sky, a meteorite with a creepy message, a disturbing encounter with a mountain ghost, and an unsettling gift from the past, gifted to Qin directly from a god. Emperor Qin Shi Huang was born in 259 BC towards the end of the Warring States period in ancient China. He ascended to the throne of the Qin State at the age of 13, where he proceeded to the construction of his tomb. Teenagers are usually very mature and thoughtful at this age. After conquering the other six Warring States, he found the Qin Dynasty at the age of 39. Qin Shi Huang continued the prefectural and county system instead of, at that time, common feudalism and centralized power in the central government. He standardized measurements and established uniformity in written language and laws, paving the way for over two millennia of autocratic rule in China. Qin Shi Huang believed that traditional ties such as king and lord were insufficient to demonstrate his elevated status of being the first man who ever unified China. Therefore, he created the new title of Emperor and bestowed it upon himself, referring to himself as the First Emperor, which turned out later to also be the penultimate of the Qin Dynasty. Yes, his reign was marked by an ambitious public works program, including the construction of the Great Wall of China, the Palace of Afang, the Li Mountain Tomb, and not to mention his own tomb. His ruthless policies in order to construct these marvels led to excessive labor and hardship for his people, ultimately resulting in the rapid collapse of the Qin Dynasty just three years after his death. During an inspection tour of the empire, terribly sick, Qin Shi Huang died hundreds of miles away from the capital. Together with him on the tour was his youngest son, Hu Ha, who colluded with others to create a false edict, declaring that he would succeed the throne. To avoid causing suspicion and keep news of the emperor's death concealed so that the plot wouldn't be jeopardized, the hearse carrying his body had to continue its journey back to the capital without showing any haste. It is important to note that this was in July, in the middle of summer, so naturally the corpse was rotten and gave out a foul odor the entire way. To mask the smell, stinky salted fish was stuffed into the hearse. It wasn't until September, two months after his death, that the first emperor was finally buried in the tomb. He spent 39 years building himself such a mausoleum to ensure that he could enjoy an underground world, with mercury to prevent corrosion. But before he could get in, his body had already rotted away. What a joke! According to records of the grand historian Shi Ji, after the burial, the new emperor Hu Ha ordered to have all the builders and craftsmen buried alive between the inner and outer walls of the underground palace to prevent leaks. As a result, for centuries, nobody knew what the inside of the mausoleum looked like until 2,000 years later. March 1974, a severe drought had forced farmers in Xi'an, China to dig wells wherever they could in search of water. On the 29th of March, during digging, they hit a layer of red soil that was incredibly hard. One strong farmer named Yang Jifa, hoping to find a water source, managed to break through the hard layer. What appeared under seemed to him to be the top part of a pottery bowl. This is where the ancestors used to make pottery, Yang told his companions. They asked him to proceed with caution, saying that if they dug up some pottery containers, they could take them home and use them to store things. So they continued to dig deeper and uncovered the shoulders and chest of a pottery figurine. It might not be a pottery kiln, but a temple or shrine of some sort, Yang speculated. 
As they dug further down, they discovered that the body of the figurine was intact, but one of its legs was broken and its head, missing from above, was lying beneath it. This was the first terracotta figurine discovered at the site, later identified as a warrior figurine. Piles of arrowheads were found as they dug deeper. You smoke, right? Maybe these things can be exchanged for tobacco, Yang's companion jokingly suggested, so they carried them up to the surface. Eight broken terracotta figurines, as well as floor paving bricks, bronze crossbows, and arrowheads were dug out at that time. Villagers were at an absolute loss for words when they looked at these strange-looking terracotta personages that they couldn't even name. Some villagers came to burn incense and pay homage to these terracotta gods, while others, unhappy about the discovery, regarded them as a bad omen of the drought and avoided them. The village will be jinxed as well as Yang himself. On April the 25th, almost a month after the dig, cultural relic expert Zhao Kangmin learned the news over the phone and was surprised and delighted to hear that the heads of the terracotta figures were even larger than human heads. He rode his bike all the way to Xiyang village where he saw the broken figurines scattered around the well. After observing them for a while, Zhao Kangmin determined that this was a burial pit. These aren't terracotta gods, but could possibly be national treasures. The next day, Zhao Kangmin put the broken figurines on a cart and sent them back to the Museum of Lintong for safekeeping and restoration. Three days later, two terracotta warriors, 1.78 meters tall, dressed in battle armor, were restored. He pointed to the two restored terracotta figurines and told Xinhua News Agency reporter Lin Anwen, these are terracotta warrior figurines from the Qin Dynasty. There is no record of them in the history books. Judging by the situation, they belong to the terracotta warriors and horses burial pit of Qin Shi Huang's mausoleum. Later in July, the National Culture Heritage Administration sent the first work team of four archaeologists. There started one of the most unbelievable discoveries that has ever been made. While this is believable, there are many other aspects surrounding the tomb itself and Qin Shi Huang in general that may not be as believable. Remember the mountain ghost, the meteorite, and all that other spooky stuff we mentioned earlier? Well, the legends behind them are some of the reasons as to why a good chunk of the locals were not okay with the tomb being excavated. According to records of the grand historian Shi Ji, in the year 211 BCE, the 36th year of the reign of Emperor Qin Shi Huang, three strange events occurred. Firstly, there was an astronomical phenomenon called Ying Hao Shu Xin, in which the planet Mars, referred to as Ying Hao by ancient Chinese, was seen near the star Antares, referred to as Xin by the Chinese, which is now known as the Scorpio constellation. This was considered a bad omen, with some believing that it was a sign that the emperor would lose his throne or even die. During the same year, a meteorite fell in the Dong Commandery, present-day Puyang City, Henan Province, and someone carved the words, Qin Shi Huang dies, and there his kingdom shall be divided onto it. This news reached the emperor, who became furious and ordered officials to investigate. When no one confessed, he had all the people living in the area around the meteorite killed and the meteorite destroyed. To cheer himself up, the emperor ordered a poem called Immortal, or Xianzhen Renshi, to be composed by a scholar, and it was performed by musicians wherever he went on his travels. This is where things begin to get a bit weirder. One evening in the autumn of the same year, an envoy was stopped by a man carrying a jade bai, which is a flat jade disc with a hole in the center. The man demanded that the envoy give the bai to the emperor and said, This year, Julong dies. When asked for an explanation, the man disappeared. The envoy returned the jade bai to the emperor and reported a strange encounter. Qin Shi Huang claimed that the strange man was nothing but a mountain ghost and it could only predict events up to a year in advance. He dismissed the incident, saying that the term Zhulong here is to be explained as referring to human ancestors, not one of his appellations. Later though, the emperor ordered the imperial household to examine the jade bai and discovered that it was the exact same one that he had cast into the river years ago as an offering to the river god. The emperor consulted divination for this matter, and the results showed that to be auspicious and that there shall be movements. Therefore, he ordered the relocation of 30,000 households and granted each household with one level of nobility. In addition, in the following year, 210 BC, he conducted his fifth imperial tour during his lifetime. However, he did not escape his fate and died on the way during the tour. While this is all but a legend, many Chinese people hold this to be true and prefer to be cautious of these superstitions. Regardless, this did not affect the dig at all though. 
Archaeologists have been working at the Terracotta Army site for half a century and discovered three pits covering more than 20,000 square meters. There are three pits arranged in a triangle shape facing west to east. The first pit, which was discovered earliest, yes, the famous well, is rectangular and covers an area of 14,260 square meters. It contains over 6,000 terracotta figurines of warriors and horses. The second pit, located to the northeast of the first pit, looks like a giant tri-square, covering an area of approximately 6,000 square meters. It has a more complete set of troops with a more complex battle formation, including over 1,300 terracotta warriors, horses, and over 80 chariots. The third pit has the smallest area, being only 520 square meters, and located at the western end of the first pit. It contains a whopping 68 warrior figurines. Judging from the layout of the third pit, it is likely the command center. Tens of thousands of weapons and equipment have also been unearthed from the pits. The over 8,000 figurines in total are arranged in battle formation, with soldiers, archers, cavalry, and chariots. Each warrior is unique, with different facial features, hairstyles, and clothing, and an average height of around 1.75 meters, or 5 foot 8 for our American friends. The overall attention to detail is incredible, with the warriors wearing real weapons and armor. Archaeologists have also noticed the impressively advanced metallurgy technology used in the weapons. For a start, several bronze swords were unearthed without rust. Analysis then pointed out that these swords have used a chromium plating rust-proof technology, which is surprisingly generalized from the 20th century. Compared with the swords of the other six states during the Warring States period, the swords of the Qin state were significantly longer, 50 to 60 centimeters versus 85 to 94 centimeters. This was because Qin's metallurgical craftsmen were able to accurately control the ratio of copper and tin in the bronze alloy, so the swords cast were long and not easily broken, neither soft nor brittle. Archaeologists also uncovered a sword that was bent underneath a fallen figurine. For over 2,200 years, the 150-kilogram terracotta warrior had been pressing the sword, yet the sword demonstrated its incredible resilience as it slowly sprang back to its original shape and flattened out again after the terracotta warrior was removed. Another astonishing fact about the weapons is their extremely small manufacturing tolerance. For instance, out of the over 40,000 arrowheads excavated, the margin of error was only 0.83 millimeters, or 1 32nd of an inch. The terracotta warriors that we see today are unpainted, but when they were made, they consisted of vibrant colors such as green, red, purple, yellow, and many more. The purple pigment used on the terracotta warriors has piqued the interest of many archaeologists. This unique shade of purple is often referred to as Chinese purple. Instead of coming directly from nature, it is a unique synthetic pigment. Chinese purple is actually an intermediate product of a series of chemical reactions. The first step in this process produces a pigment called Chinese Deep Blue. The second step produces Chinese purple. If the product goes on, the final product is a material called Chinese Blue. Four ingredients are needed to produce Chinese purple. Lead oxide as a solvent, barium sulfate as a contrast agent, malachite which is a type of copper rust, and sand which provides quartz. The proportion and temperature, around 1000 degrees Celsius, must be precisely controlled in order to produce this pigment. This purple color is unique to China and was only used from the 5th century BC to the 3rd century AD, where the production technique was eventually lost to time. Everything just mentioned is just a few of the examples of the countless fascinating aspects of the Terracotta Army. In fact, it is generally believed that the Terracotta Army is located on the mere periphery of Qin Shi Huang's mausoleum, serving as guardians of the tomb and forming an integral part of the overall construction, which according to archaeologists, measures more than 56 square kilometers. To compare, it is about the same size as the city of San Francisco, which covers an area of 46.9 square kilometers, or roughly twice the size of Manhattan Island, which has an area of 22.8 square kilometers. So big! The Terracotta Army is located approximately 955.5 meters east of the burial mound of the Emperor. The existing burial mound has a length of 350 meters from north to south, a width of 345 meters from east to west, and a height of 76 meters high. The layout of the tomb complex is modeled after the capital of the Qin dynasty, Xianyang. The complex is divided into an inner and outer city, with the inner city having a circumference of 2.5 kilometers, and the outer city having a circumference of 6.3 kilometers. To the southwest of the inner city, there is a huge underground palace, where the coffin of Qin Shi Huang is to eventually be placed. 
Archaeologists estimate that there are about 600 burial pits for accompanying objects around the complex. One of the accompanying pits, closer to the central tomb than the Terracotta Army, has recently been excavated, revealing a number of figurines identified as representing some senior officials. Archaeologists hold the idea that records of the grand historian Shiji claims that it took 39 years to build the whole mausoleum, and even towards the end of the construction, there were 700,000 people working, which was roughly around 5% of China's population at the time. Currently, there have been no excavations of the mausoleum. We can only speculate about the appearance of the tomb through historical records. Here is a passage from the records of the Grand Historian, or Shiji. 70,000 workers were involved in the construction of the mausoleum of the first emperor of Qin. They dug through three layers of underground water and poured in molten copper to fill gaps, constructed palaces, arranged the positions for officials, and placed precious treasures. They also installed traps, crossbows, and arrows to prevent tomb robbers. They used mercury to create the appearance of rivers and oceans, and mechanical devices to stimulate the flow of river. The ceiling was adorned with astronomical images made of pearls and gemstones, while the geography was displayed on the floor. Long-lasting lamps were made from the oil of whale. The sources of information for records of the grand historian Shiji mainly include three types. 1. The literature that was passed down at the time. 2. The author's personal on-site investigation. and 3. Oral history from interviews with local elders. However, the records of the grand historian Shiji was written at the beginning of the 1st century BC, roughly 120 years after the death of Qin Shi Huang. So, how credible is this passage about the mausoleum? The archaeological survey and prospecting have indeed found an underground palace, located at about 10 stories deep underground, and is approximately 80 meters long and 50 meters wide, with a surface of about the size of 10 basketball courts. The palace has a stone ceiling and walls and is indeed covered with a huge waterproof area that forms a dam to prevent water from flooding the palace. Another amazing discovery made during the prospecting was that the mercury content in the soil of the area was eight times higher than normal, and it was higher in the east part than in the west, which is also in line with the geography of China. The sea is to the east of the mainland. It seems that rivers and oceans made of mercury are not totally nonsense. But of all of this, the records of the grand historian Shiji have gotten one thing wrong. For example, the actual finding in the surrounding areas, including artifacts, items from craftsmen, and slave residential areas, indicate that the builders came from all seven warring states of the warring states period, which could only have been possible after the unification of the country. Another argument is about the chief builder, the prime minister Li Si. Since it is unlikely that the construction of the imperial tomb was overseen by a minister of justice, and Li Si only became prime minister about the time of the unification, it can be inferred that the construction time was from the 28th to the 34th year of the reign of Qin Shi Huang, which is roughly 219 to 213 BC, taking about seven years to complete, which seems to be even more incredible. After the Qin Dynasty, many powerful dynasties emerged in Chinese history. However, the method of building large-scale tombs like the Mausoleum of Qin Shi Huang was condemned. During the following Han Dynasty, 3rd century BC to 2nd century AD, although pottery figurines still existed, they were small in size and did not require much manpower and material resources. From the 3rd to 6th century, China advocated for simple burials. Later, the way in which rulers expressed their authority changed. For example, the Way of the Northern Way, 4th to 6th century, emperors were to sculpt Buddha statues, and the Tang Dynasty, 7th to 10th century, rulers built their tombs by mountains, making the entire mountain a witness to the deceased. The use of burial figures reached its peak in the Qin Dynasty, and was the swan song of all burials in the entire East. If you enjoyed today's episode of Amateur Archaeology, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel. Also, please make sure to smash the absolute crap out of that bell button so you get notifications on not only our latest videos, but the ancient coin giveaways that we're going to be doing once we reach 5,000 subscribers. So please share this video with a fellow history lover so we can reach that goal faster and you can get a chance to win a real, authentic ancient coin. In the meantime though, we'll see you next time, only on Amateur Archaeology.